Hi, good afternoon and uh, welcome to our webinar on uh, our Kings of Capital Portfolio. It's the financials focused uh, portfolio. Um, today, we're going to be uh, talking about um, uh, an update on our portfolio in terms of the uh, specific companies underlying fundamental performance, but also talking about the biggest issue that's plaguing especially the lenders in terms of the liquidity challenges resulting in uh, lack of deposit growth despite a very strong credit environment uh, in the economy uh, as well as lenders. Um, so we have with us Thet Shah, who's the portfolio manager of the strategy, uh, giving us uh, an update on the portfolio as well as helping us um, you know, unravel uh, this whole liquidity complex and the implications on our portfolio and the sector going forward. So with that, I hand it over to Tej. Uh, Tej, go ahead, please. Thank you, Pramod. So, um, first of all, we'll start with uh, the broad topic about what's happening on the sector in terms of liquidity and why are we seeing uh, significant challenges on raising deposits, especially for banks. Um, and uh, so far, over the last three years, we've seen significant tailwinds for the sector. Uh, we believe from here on, uh, the going will get a bit tougher um, on both profitability as well as growth. Uh, so to start off with, we'll start and address um, the elephant in the room, which is why, why is there been so much talk about deposits? Why is there been so much talk about lack of liquidity in the system? Um, and uh, what we've done over here is you looked at a longer term trend of loan growth and deposit growth for the banking sector as a whole. Uh, because what happens is we generally, uh, by looking at monthly or quarterly data, tend to get caught up in the here and the now. Uh, but to put these things into context, when we look at the 10-year data, uh, we see that actually deposit growth, which is on this uh, slide, the blue line, has actually been uh, fine. Even as we speak, in absolute terms, the deposit growth is at about 13-14%, which has been actually above average uh, if we were to look at the previous decade. Because between 2014 and 22 or 2014 and 23, uh, deposit growth is averaged at about 11 to 13% for the sector. Um, deposit growth, as we speak, is also at about 13, 14% for the sector. However, it's after quite a long period of time uh, that loan growth uh, is also at about, for the sector, more than 13, 14%. Uh, the second thing is uh, that between 2014 and 2020, uh, during that six to seven year period, uh, there were not multiple participants who were uh, lending, um, as in most of the PSU banks had challenges of their own on asset quality. Uh, even within the private banking space, there were only the likes of HDFC and Kotak, which were growing loans at 18 to 20%. As we speak today, uh, there are a host of small finance banks. Almost all private banks are growing their loan book at about 17, 18%. And there are PSU banks, uh, which is also about uh, 55 to 60 percent of the sector. They have also become quite active in the lending market. Uh, given that almost 90 to 95 percent of the banking industry is growing loans at about uh, the sector average, uh, there is about 90 to 95 percent of the market which is also growing deposits at 12, 13 percent. What this has done is. For the large private sector banks, they've had to either make a difficult choice of either increasing rates uh, on deposits or they need to slow down their loan book because there are just not enough deposits to keep growing their loan book at uh, the high teens levels which they've been historically used to. So it's in this context that uh, there has been talk about lack of liquidity. So while for a sector as a whole, deposit growth of 13-14% is not bad, it's actually higher than what we have seen historically. Uh, it's just that this 13-14% growth is being well distributed across uh, banks because the sector is seeing all-time low NPAs along with uh, an all-time high uh, tier one along with extremely healthy loan growth of 15-16%. So uh, with this, uh, we move on to the second challenge. So while we've seen overall deposits have grown at 13-14%, uh, the bigger challenge has been CASA growth has been falling. So current account and savings account uh, 
uh, which is the low cost funds which banks get and that is why they are at an advantage to nbfcs uh, that hit an all time high of about 45% in fy22 uh, this was when interest rates were falling this is just before the fed started raising rates and went from 0% all the way to now about 5 5.5% uh, before that uh, the previous high on casa before covid was because of demonetization uh before demonetization the casa ratio for the banking system used to be around 35 to 38% uh during demonetization a lot of money came into the banking system that began the process of real financial financialization of um household savings and we saw an uptick in 2016 17 from 35% to 41 42% uh it's in the last 2 3 quarters or about a year's time that we have seen casa ratio for the banking system fall because what usually happens is uh in a low interest rate environment the difference between the savings account rate which usually is for a large bank say around 4 4.5% and a fixed deposit rate uh, for a large bank is anywhere between 6 to 7% this gap in a low interest rate environment is usually only about 1.5 to 2% uh and that was what led to high casa ratio for the banking system in 21 22 as we speak today uh some of the banks some of the smaller banks are offering rates as high as 8 8.5% on fixed deposits versus the 4% savings account rate offered by the likes of hdfc bank or icici bank as this gap has widened to about 4% a lot of household savings have moved to fixed deposits because people see that there is an arbitrage at offer uh, lazy money therefore it does not exist it moves to the 7.5 to 8% rates uh, corporates also which usually park their money in current accounts start moving their money around uh, because zero as money becomes dearer 0% uh, earning 0% for corporates is also uh, not an affordable outcome for them as a result of that in the past year year and a half we have seen casa ratios for the bank, banking sector uh, go down uh, because people have moved money to term deposits people have moved money to liquid liquid accounts uh, money market funds uh, and in turn all of that money while it comes back to the banking system it comes back in the form of wholesale money which is higher cost money and it's not granular uh, savings account money or current account money which comes back to the banking sector uh what this results in is uh, two things one is uh, cost of money for the banking sector goes up cost of funds for the banking sector progressively over the past year or so has gone up um as a result of this uh, the banking sector sees a crunch in margins and therefore uh, over the past year all the discussion around our uh, investee companies in the banking and nbfc space have been around net interest margins whether the whole speculation is around whether the net interest margins have bottomed out how long is it before we see net interest margins bottoming out uh, for banks and nbfcs um, and are we really past the increase in cost of funds uh, so if we were to look at our investments which is the large private sector banks uh, the good part is that despite the slowdown in deposits uh, over the past 3 years 5 years and 10 years the big four private sector banks have consistently gained market share on deposits so in fy14 the deposit market share for these four private banks used to be 14% uh, that is almost doubled uh, over the past uh, 10 years to about 26% uh, and uh, all the four private banks have gained market share consistently uh, almost all of them have as a result of that uh, grown the deposit book at uh, 17 to 18% over the past and yields uh so while uh, we are seeing 14% deposit growth as a result of market share gains we believe that our investee companies the large private sector banks they can grow their deposits at 16 17% even with the current growth rates uh, in deposits now this brings us to the big question on what's been the margin trajectory like uh so if you were to look at margins for the banks today what we've done is we split 
are lending investments into banks and NBFCs because the trajectory for banks and NBFCs and margins have different drivers. Uh, even within NBFCs, you would have a Chola, which is a vehicle financer largely, or a Bajaj Finance, which is a consumer financer. Even for them, the drivers of margins are different. Uh, even for a housing finance company, the drivers of margins are different. And within the big four banks, you would have a HDFC bank which is going through a merger. And therefore, drivers of margin for HDFC bank are different from a Kotak bank, which is seeing a change in loan mix versus an ICIC or an Axis bank. But we broadly, rather than go into all of these nuances, we broadly split up our lending universe into banks and NBFCs. Now, if you were to look at uh, our banking investments, which are about 40% of ACP today, uh, the view line suggests that the yields have over a period of time, if you were to take QY, Q2, FY22 as a starting point, the yields have gone up. Uh, however, along with that, the cost of funds have also gone up. Net-net, as a result of that, we are currently at net interest margins, which are similar to Q2, FI22 net interest margins. Uh, and we, I think, are at uh, steady level, steady state margins, maybe 5 to 10 bips compression from here on for the banks uh, in our portfolio. Uh, because what usually happens for banks is they see an upfronting of uh, increase in yield on advances. Uh, but over a period of time, the cost of deposits also catch up. Uh, so if you were to see Q3 FI23, which is December 2022, uh, that is when we started seeing an increase in cost of deposits. Uh, and that was therefore the peak of net interest margin for our banking investments. Uh, we believe that about 3.5% 3 .5 to 3.6% uh, for our overall banking portfolio uh, should not see any further deterioration in NIMS. Uh, this includes HDFC bank margins as well, which have been compressed because of the merger. Uh, we believe that from here on, maybe about a quarter or a two is what it will take for the margins to stabilize. And from here on, we'll see an upward slope on margins for HDFC bank. Uh, barring uh, any surprises on uh, deposit growth. Uh, and we'll uh, discuss the deposit growth for the latest quarter, which has been a positive surprise in general. Uh, if we were to discuss the net interest margins and uh, see what's happened to NBFCs, uh, we believe over here there is actually headroom for net interest margins to improve once rate cuts come through. Uh, so if we were to look at the net interest margins uh, and spreads for our NBFCs in the portfolio, they've actually improved from the same starting point of Q2 FI22. Uh, and despite this, we believe that uh, there is some headroom over here. Uh, these companies can go to maybe 7.5% spreads, uh, which is where, what they went to uh, in Q3 FI23, which was the peak that they have seen. Uh, we believe that these companies can go through uh, maybe a quarter or a couple of quarters of stagnation or marginal decline in spreads. But from there on, uh, there is some room for spreads to improve. Uh, so net-net, I think uh, we are at the bottom on net interest margins for banks and NBFCs, maybe a quarter of 5 to 10 bips marginal compression uh, in Q4 for the banks. But from there on, even assuming... Uh, only a 25 bips sort of rate cut uh, this uh, calendar year, I think uh, margins have uh, bottomed out uh, for both banks and NBFCs in our portfolio. Uh, so if we were to therefore analyze the overall, overall p and uh, along with the growth prospects for banks and NBFCs, uh, we believe uh, we are heading for some amount of headwinds uh, on the p and and growth for the sector as a whole. Uh, the reason that I say this is, first of all, over the last three years, the banking sector as a whole has seen uh, for every consecutive year reducing gross NPAs for the sector. Uh, what that has resulted in is minimal credit costs, minimum, minimum provisioning for NPAs, uh, and in some cases, even negative uh, credit costs or provisioning as 
a large part of the banking universe has seen recoveries um, in their uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, so first of all, we'll see credit costs normalizing. Secondly, as we discussed, uh, there might not be a significant uh, uh, deposit growth that the sector might see or deposit growth might lag uh, the loan growth for the sector. Uh, therefore, unlike 2021 or 2022, where we saw extremely strong loan growth uh, for the sector, uh, loan growth might not be as broad-based as we've seen over the last two, three years. Uh, there will be select lenders who will be able to grow their loan book at 20% plus. Uh, and thirdly, uh, margins will not be very easy to come by for the sector as a whole. Because uh, cost of funds have completely normalized. We are no longer in a, a, a repo rate environment, which is extremely low, similar to 21 or 22. Cost of funds have com completely normalized. Um, and therefore, we believe the only uh, lever on balance sheets of banks and NBFCs, which might turn out to be a positive surprise, is OPEX or cost to income ratios. Um, everything else, I think we are headed for headwinds, uh, or at best, uh, like we discussed, NIMS, we might remain where we are today. Uh, so, growth might become a headwind for the sector. Credit cost is definitely not going to be as good as what we have seen in the last two, three years. Uh, it's only cost to income ratios uh, which might uh, surprise on the positive or might be a lever for improving ROAs. Uh, therefore, and this is with uh, picture perfect macros uh, without any external shocks from the global from a global perspective or any or any uh, domestic uh, macro shocks on asset quality. And therefore, uh, in that context, when we look at um, uh, AAA spreads, which are almost minimal, as in there is no differentiation between a AAA corporate lending versus a AA corporate lending. Uh, there are no spreads which exist for credit risk. Uh, when we see uh, almost no one building in higher credit costs than what we are seeing for banks and NBFCs, uh, when we see a lot of uh, participation from retail investors and capital markets and markets hitting all-time highs, with lots of QIPs and lots of IPOs. Uh, with these sorts of uh, 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 headwinds that we are talking about, uh, the amount of buoyancy that we see in capital markets and uh, the lending market, it becomes extremely important for us to test all our investments in the financial services space for uh, any sort of shock or any sort of downturn that we might see. Because it's always in good times uh, that uh, we typically see mistakes being made in this sector. Uh, so what we have done is we've analyzed our portfolio and stress tested our portfolio to look at uh, what are the monitorables, what is it that we should be aware of in terms of risks that we are carrying in the portfolio, and uh, what might happen if there is a liquidity shock given that we are at all-time high rates, we are at all-time low on liquidity, uh, what might happen to some of these companies um, and how are we positioned as a portfolio? Uh, so to start off with, we'll start off with the banks. I think uh, Kodak Bank would actually be a beneficiary of this, given that the last three years, the stock has been a laggard, um, even though it's compounded earnings at about 20%. Uh, the reason that it's lagged behind is because of a derating. And uh, we believe that this derating is because the sector has opened up. There has actually been no risk. And Kotak's been a stock which has done extremely well when there has been significant amount of risks uh, in the banking sector. So Kotak actually uh, will be a big beneficiary if we see a downturn in the sector. Uh, uh, the only thing is uh, that uh, from about low single digit exposure to unsecured loans, it's gone up to about 11 to 12%. And it's for the first time that its unsecured exposure will get tested. I say, I say bank again, uh, strong balance sheet. Uh, asset quality will uh, be the only monitorable over here. Uh, we just need to be aware that I say, I say bank over the last three to four years has been a turnaround. Um, and its asset quality for the first time will get tested if we see a banking sector downturn. Uh, HDFC bank, we don't have any risks or we don't foresee any risks or worries on asset quality. Uh, if there is a liquidity shock, its merger match might get postponed by a few quarters, uh, given that it's the it's the biggest uh, uh, bank 
private sector bank and it's got the highest ask on deposits if there is a liquidity shock or if there is a dearth on deposits hdfc bank will be hit for the short term but we don't see any worries on uh, long term growth or on challenges of asset quality actually hdfc bank will be the first one to see differentiation on asset quality as soon as there is a downturn Axis Bank would be a bit worried, and therefore our position on Axis Bank has been pared down. Uh, it's been the lowest uh, in terms of position sizing. Axis Bank is now at the lowest position that we've held in the last three, three and a half years of KCP. Because in case there is a downturn, uh, we believe Axis Bank versus on a comparative basis versus our other holdings in the banking sector might suffer. Uh, 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 some amount of uh, 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 credit costs. And it might also not be able to capitalize on other opportunities that the other private banks like Kotak or HDFC or ICICI Bank might see in terms of a downturn. Uh, City Union Bank is actually a conservatively run bank. Its challenges have stemmed over the last three years from other factors apart from deposit growth or apart from asset quality or loan growth. It's largely been to do with uh, regulatory challenges, uh, some amount of transition on uh, MD and CEO, um, and therefore, we don't see, we see it to be a bit disconnected from most of what would happen in the uh, macro crisis. So, City Union Bank should actually be insulated from what happens in a uh, macro crisis. Now, moving to uh, the NBFCs and the non lenders, uh, Bajaj Finance, uh, we've seen uh, Bajaj Finance bounce back quite rapidly from a macro crisis every time something's happened. Whether it be COVID, whether it be ILFS, whether it be 2022, uh, when uh, Fed rate increased rates. Uh, however, from a perception perspective, Bajaj Finance always been viewed by the market as a high risk, uh, high growth lender. Uh, so while uh, we've seen historically stock price correct significantly during a macro downturn, uh, we don't see any risk on earnings. Uh, we we believe the company has a culture of uh, being extremely agile. Um, and dealing with challenges in uh, in, in a way which uh, we've seen has actually benefited them, and uh, whether it be COVID or whether it be uh, ILFS, because they've bounced back from challenges to come out even stronger on the other side. Uh, similarly, Chola is the second largest NBFC now in India after the HDFC Limited merger. So over here as well, we see that it's an extremely strong balance sheet generates 20% plus growth, 20% plus return on equity. Uh, again, over here, a bit like Kotak, the monitorable for us remains unsecured lending, which is for them a new foray. Uh, even though it remains in mid single digits, uh, we need to be careful in leveraged entities where even about a couple of percentage points of credit costs can hamper ROAs and ROEs quite significantly. So Bajaj and Chola will actually again be beneficiaries, even though they might see some drawdowns uh, from a share price perspective, they'll be a long-term beneficiary in case there is a shakeout in the credit ecosystem. Uh, Avas is uh, uh, doing secured lending. And uh, if we see uh, a shakeout in the credit ecosystem, some sort of liquidity challenges, Avas actually will be a big beneficiary. Uh, because what we have seen over the past couple of years is there have been tens of housing finance companies which have entered the market. All of them trying to do affordable housing have raised tons of equity capital. The debt markets have also supported them. Uh, but uh, what that has led to is AWAS has seen increased competition, some pressure on spreads, and a lot of pressure on attrition. Uh, so as soon as some of these fringe players, some of these smaller NBFCs see some challenges, AWAS will be a big beneficiary. Uh, and Avas has a really well-managed balance sheet, uh, positive a ALM, uh, keeps significant surplus liquidity, and is actually amongst the affordable housing financiers, the most conservative lender. Uh, so we believe uh, Avas will be a big beneficiary in case there is a tighter liquidity environment and some of the affordable housing financiers see some challenges. Uh, coming to mass finance, uh, it's done extremely well over the past decade where most of the banks and NBFCs saw some of the other challenges. However, we believe at about 10,000 crores uh, of AUM, uh, it will be at this size, uh, first test for mass finance on risk management. Uh, they've also increased their 
retail loan book over the past uh, two to three years in terms of proportion of their loan book. Um, and at 10,000 crores, uh, they will see a different set of challenges on the liability side, unlike uh, the challenges when they were at 3,000, 4,000 crores of AUM. Uh, they're also planning to raise equity capital over the next two to three quarters. Uh, we hope that they uh, are able to raise that at the earliest uh, before any sort of macro challenges hit uh, the banking or NDFC sector. Um, otherwise, we don't see any significant challenges uh, for mass given that uh, they have a good track record of managing the risk. Uh, they are running conservatively managed balance sheet, no mismatches on ALM. Uh, however, given it remains a small NBFC, uh, it remains vulnerable to the SME and MSME cycle, uh, we need to be a bit more careful over here. Uh, coming to the insurance companies, uh, they are not as geared as the banks or NBFCs. Secondly, they are sitting on excess float, excess liquidity. Uh, ICICI, Lombard, HDFC Life, both can be big beneficiaries of uh, uh, in case there is a downturn on the banking sector. Because they sit on excess float, they'll be actually able to deploy this excess float at better and better yields. And they'll be also able to buy equities at better valuations in case there is a downturn in the banking sector. So net-net, uh, as we analyze the portfolio, we feel quite comfortable um, in case we see a liquidity shock. Uh, because apart from a couple of companies which will not be long-term beneficiaries, uh, in case we see some sort of challenges, in case we see challenges on liquidity, uh, we believe about 85 to 90% of the portfolio will be largely insulated in the long term, will actually be a beneficiary in case uh, there is a shakeout in the banking sector. So uh, moving on to uh, an update in this context on our portfolio. Uh, this is the since inception performance. Um, over the past year, we've seen some recovery in terms of absolute performance. However, we continue to lag the index. Uh, to put this into context, uh, the initial year or so of KCP, we were up 43%. Uh, this was the recovery that we saw post-COVID. The most challenging period for KCP was uh, the calendar year 2022 or November 21 to March 23, where we saw rates uh, in the US go from zero to 5%. That was accompanied with a large amount of FII outflow. And most of our companies, despite healthy profit growth, saw significant uh, derating um, because uh, they were the ones which were owned by FIIs. Uh, finally, FII, was, FII flows have ab abated. Uh, there have been early signs of rates peaking. Uh, and over the past financial year, we have seen about 19% post fees, post expenses uh, bounce back in terms of performance for KCP. Uh, in this context, if we were to look at the overall portfolio and contribution to returns, uh, what we've seen is we've not seen any significant blunders. We've not seen any stock which has delivered a massive negative. Even Avas uh, is on the mend. Uh, over the past month, we have seen re received a pre-quarterly uh, update, which has been pretty strong. We believe in the case of Avas, we'll from here on see a stronger share price performance as well because uh, there have been factors around succession, there have been factors around overhang of promoters exiting, private equity exiting, uh, slowdown in loan growth. All of those we believe are behind us. So it's largely been in that context, uh, stagnation in share price or time correction, um, and that too not because of slowdown in profit growth. It's largely been because of uh, 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 P multiples correcting for a large part of the portfolio. So if you were to look at uh, what we are showing on this screen is the P multiple correction or contraction, uh, whether it be versus the bank nifty or versus the history of these more companies, uh, while the stock market has redated over the past two or three years, most of these companies are now available at valuations which are lower than the valuations for these companies three years, five years, or seven years ago. So KCP as a portfolio and absolute terms uh, over the past five to seven years is derated by about 30 to 35%. So if you were to take a five-year number, uh, on a median basis, the portfolio valuations are down by about 40%. Uh, 
And uh, if you were to look at it on a relative basis, which are the columns uh, on the right versus the bank Nifty, KCP is available uh, at a 30% lower premium to the bank Nifty uh, versus what it was five years ago. Uh, and this has been the case across a lot of companies. Uh, a lot of quality financials have derated in absolute terms as well as relative terms, which is what has led to what we showed on this slide, which is a lot of these companies, we've not lost money over, uh, uh, over here, uh, but we've seen significant amounts of time correction. So moving to absolute fundamentals, uh, if we were to look at FI 19 to 22, 23 or 24, uh, the weighted average or the median profit growth has been quite healthy. Uh, across the board, it's been around the 20 to 25 percent number, along with return on equity also, which is off, which is quite healthy in uh, the high teens to about 20 percent. Uh, over the past year, while we have seen share prices bounce back and they've been uh, uh, moving in line with largely profit growth, there have been a large part of the portfolio where still catch up on share price versus profit growth is yet to happen. So if you were to look at the last column in this screen, the two-year Kager is still about 7-8%, while uh, the two-year Kager on profits would be 22-23%. Uh, moving to uh, even recent most performance for the KCP companies, uh, which is the quarter ended December, and we've also got an update for the quarter ended March for some of these companies. Uh, as you can see, uh, the nine-month number or the FI23 number continues to be uh, uh, strong, and it is continued in the quarter ended December as well. So, 22% uh, profit growth, 22% uh, loan growth for the KCB lenders is extremely strong in an environment as we discussed of tight liquidity, uh, tight uh, deposit growth, um, and banking sector growth of about 16 to 17%. Uh, even our non-lenders have continued to do well. Uh, the insurance companies uh, continue to gain market share. Uh, prudent uh, benefits from the strong tailwind of SIPs and capital market flows. Um, Info is also uh, is doing uh, better in the context of uh, the slowdown in IT hiring, as it's diversified into non-IT hiring plus some of its investments, listed investments. So, Mato Policy Bazaar are also doing well. So, Q3 continued to be strong. Uh, there were no uh, sort of uh, negative, massive negative surprises apart from HDFC Bank, which we'll cover in the Q&A session. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions on that. Uh, moving on uh, to the even recent most quarter, which is quarter ended uh, March 2024. Uh, there have been five companies which constitute about uh, half the portfolio, 50% uh, of the portfolio that have given us the... Uh, Q4 2024 update. Uh, HDFC Bank uh, surprised on the positive after a week or lower than expectations uh, December quarter. Uh, overall deposits grew by almost 32% annualized, 8% uh, sequentially. Uh, they, we believe, consciously slowed down loan growth to only 2% sequentially. Uh, we believe this was actually strategically a very good move. And this is what they should have done as early as September or December. Uh, given that they were seeing that deposit growth is slowing down, this was the most rational thing to do. Given that they've done this, uh, loan, to, loan to deposit ratio has come down from 110 to 105%. A couple of quarters more of the same strategy, we believe will result in loan to deposit ratio going down to uh, uh, 95%. And that is where we should be comfortable. They should be in a good place to accelerate loan growth. Um, and all the positive things that they've been talking about the merger should then fructify in the PNL and balance sheet. Maybe uh, that will take a quarter more, a couple of quarters more for the market to also gain confidence that they are able to or are capable of doing that. Uh, Bajaj Finance, as usual, reported 30% plus growth. Uh, this is despite a couple of products of Bajaj Finance. Uh, being under a ban from the RBI. Uh, if this uh, would not have been the case, the 34% number would have been more like 35-36%. Uh, Bajaj Finance's guidance itself was 29 to 31% loan growth, and they've beaten that by about 2-3%. Uh, so we believe Bajaj Finance continues to be in a good place. Uh, 
it would be one of the few large lenders which will grow at 25% plus in FY25. Uh, most of the banks, we believe, will grow at 17 to 18% in FY25. Bajaj and Chola will be the ones will, which will grow at 25% plus in FY25. Um, Avas financiers, actually, uh, if, uh, uh, if if anyone were to ask us, the positive uh, surprise was the highest. Surprise the most on the positive side in its pre-quarter update. Because all the factors which we were worried about are gradually lining up in the case of Avas. Uh, after a long period of time, uh, disbursement growth is back to 20% YOI. Uh, asset quality remains top-notch. Uh, even on its great asset quality show in December, there is a sequential improvement. Uh, because they're doing 20% disbursement growth, we believe OPEX should fall in place. Uh, and uh, because they've uh, done all of this, we believe all the uh, uh, early starter problems on uh, technology are behind them. So all the teething issues on Salesforce, all the teething issues on implementation of disbursement on Salesforce should be behind them because we, without that, the 20% YOI disbursement growth is unlikely. So Avas Financiers is now doing exactly what we expected. That is December deposit, uh, sorry, December disbursement growth uh, was better than September. March now is better than December. Uh, so therefore, we remain quite bullish on Avas. Uh, this is uh, the quarterly update, which surprised the most on the positive, apart from HDFC Bank, which did 8% sequential uh, deposit growth. Uh, Chola did well. Uh, However, Chola slow, uh, saw, saw a slowdown in uh, CV growth and disbursements for CV financing for the quarter slowed down. However, that was more than made up by most of the other segments. We therefore saw 35% YOI growth. Uh, so while info is the number looks like 10.5% on billing growth, uh, on a sequential basis, info it saw 7.5% sequential billing growth. Uh, and therefore, it was a positive surprise. Uh, we believe InfoEdge is gaining market share and with almost zero marketing spend, uh, we'll see a sequential uptick in margins because billings will eventually convert to revenues and those revenues will directly flow through to the bottom line. So that's on Q4. Net net, uh, it will be a good quarter, at least better than expectations. Uh, the large monitorable remains uh, margins. Uh, this is the usual table on KCP versus Bank Nifty. Um, as we can see on gross NPAs, on return on assets, return on equity, uh, KCP continues to be better. Uh, price to book actually for KCP versus Bank Nifty is narrowing. And we'll cover that in the coming slides. So what we're trying to see uh, on this slide is if we were to look at the KCP premium valuation, in FI18, KCP's premium was almost 100%. Um, that is... Uh, KCP lenders' book, price to book multiple was almost twice that or more than twice that of the bank nifty because its ROAs were 70% better. As we speak today, KCP's ROAs continue to be 60% better versus the bank nifty, but its premium has fallen to only 20%. And therefore, we believe uh, if anyone wants to invest in the financial services sector, KCP is a great place to be on valuations and also on growth as we showed in the previous slide. Uh, similarly, uh, because the valuations have still not caught up for KCP, we can see that there is still a, a large gap between earnings growth and valuations for KCP. So share prices, while they have in the past year or so grown by 20%, uh, there is still a gap if you were to take Q2 2021 as EPS, EPS line, which is the blue line over here, continues to outgun the red line, uh, which is the KCP stock price. Uh, we believe that this is a result of the sector opening up, which is that in which is what we saw in the previous slide, which is a large part of PSU banks, some of the smaller private banks, some of the private banks which are not doing well between 2018 and 21, all of them have recently started doing well. Investors have gotten a lot of options to invest. However, the fact remains that despite that, the premium on ROAs for KCP companies remains 60% plus. Uh, and today, while the market is not willing to pay up for that premium, that premium continues to fall for various reasons, various narratives. We believe KCP companies therefore are available at extremely attractive valuations 
for fundamentals which have not deteriorated at all uh, while that might uh, uh, take maybe a couple of quarters to reverse as long as the red lines red lines premium which is the 60% number over bank nifty remains we believe that uh, the blue line which is the premium over the bank nifty will eventually bounce back uh, finally uh, all in all if we were to look at KCP in one chart, we can see that KCP is now available at almost nifty valuations, which is 21, 22 times trailing PE multiple for 20% plus pad compounding, better ROEs than the nifty, better ROEs than the bank nifty. Uh, and therefore, this remains in a market which is not cheap by any means, one of the few pockets which offers quality and growth at decent valuations. So uh, I'll stop over here. Uh, uh, happy to take questions. So folks, uh, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please uh, start firing in your questions. We already see that there are a few out there. We'll try and take as many as possible. Um, so Tej, I think uh, let's begin with the elephant in the room in terms of the performance, um, both in terms of absolute terms as well as uh, relative terms, has been uh, uh, suboptimal. One of the uh, theses at the time of launch of KCP was uh, the fact that um, the quality lenders that are there in our portfolio, or for that matter, even the non-lenders, have a significant runway to gain market share from the relatively weaker players, whether it's PSU banks or PSU insurers. Um, they, therefore, um, this sort of a portfolio will, uh, will, will, will be the leaders of consolidation in the industry. However, what's transpired, um, at least in the banking space and the lending side, seems to be the reverse where the weaker players seem to have got a shot in the arm for various reasons. Uh, how do we, how should we see that? Is this an aberration of sorts? Um, what do you expect going forward? Will When will we get back on the trajectory that the quality lenders, the quality financials will, uh, will drive consolidation and hence superior returns to that of the benchmark? Yeah, I think uh, that's the biggest question, which is that while on an absolute basis, as we can see, uh, growth has been healthy, ROAs, ROEs have been healthy. It's on a relative basis that the gap has been bridged uh, by the PSUs and the weaker lenders. Uh, however, if you were to look at the expected numbers on growth or on market share, uh, actually con companies in our portfolio continue to gain market share almost at the same pace as uh, they've been used to. Uh, so if you were to look at this chart, uh, whether it be uh, F5, 14 to 20, 20 to 24, uh, this is the more difficult part as we speak today, which is deposit market share. Uh, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank, Access Kotak, they've continued to gain market share. Uh, so while PSU banks have seen a recovery in asset quality, they're not gaining market share as a group or they are not gaining market share even individually, whether it be SBI, PNB, or Bank of Baroda, which are uh, the relatively better run PSUs, none of them have gained market share. Uh, second point is, after all uh, that's happened uh, on the PSU side, whether it be better asset quality, benign macro, uh, the ROAs that they are reporting is, are half that of any of the private banks. The reporting 0.8 to 1% ROAs, versus 2% ROAs for the private banks. Uh, the reporting growth, which is 12 to 13%, versus growth of uh, 17 to 18% uh, for the private banks. Uh, so uh, they were reporting 2 to 5% growth with 5 to 10% return on equity. That's what's changed. Uh, the 2 to 5% growth for PSUs has gone to 12, 13%, which is why we've seen a uh, strong rally in PSUs. Uh, the delta of change has been the maximum for the PSU banks, while the delta of change for the private banks, while it's been positive, it's not been as large as that for PSU banks. Uh, so on an absolute or on a relative basis, none of the private banks or none of our investments are doing 
better uh, are doing worse than what they used to do between 2015 to 20. Uh, between 2015 to 20, I remember Kotak Bank posting 2% or 1.8% ROA. That's 2.5%. Bajaj Finance posting 4% ROA. That's 45 to 5%. HDFC Bank at 1.7% ROA is 2.1%. Uh, growth has also been better for all of these lenders. So relative change for all the companies in our portfolio has been positive, despite what the PSUs have done. However, that relative change might be 20% positive, but the weaker companies have seen a relative change of 80 to 80 to 100% positive, uh, which has been uh, the result, which has been the result of our suboptimal performance. Uh, we believe that uh, given that the relative change for our company has been positive, uh, it's more sustainable. Uh, given that uh, the PSUs have seen a lot of recoveries, that is not sustainable. Uh, neither is a 1% ROE and a 12 to 13% ROE a recipe for great sustainable compounding. 18% uh, growth with 18% ROE is a recipe for longer term sustainable compounding. And therefore, we should see uh, what we have seen over here historically, which is the premium for quality uh, come back. Uh, FI 25, 26, as we've been discussing, will not be as easy as the past two or three years for the banking sector. We see a significant amount of headwinds coming in. Uh, despite the ROA premium not falling, this our valuation premium has taken a beating. We believe uh, that that should come back in the coming couple of years. Fair point. Um, so in terms of this premium itself, do you reckon at the outset the premium was um, a bit overdone compared to the premium on the fundamentals? And hence what we've seen is a little bit of a correction to that. Maybe we've overdone on the correction front to the extent that the premium has dropped all the way to 23%, whereas the premium on ROE is, is, is fairly holding steady. Uh, yeah, that's a fair point. Um, I think... Uh... If we were to expect from here on that HDFC bank would trade at four and a half, five times book, that would be a really a hope trade. Uh, that's not an expectation that we should have at all. Uh, because uh, when it used to trade at four and a half to five times, 85% uh, of the banking sector was in shambles. Uh, it used to, HDFC bank used to grow at 25%. Uh, at the 25 lakh crore rupee balance sheet, uh, given the shape of the banking sector and the country as we speak today, we should not expect 80% of the banking sector to go through the same amount of suffering, nor would it be good for the country uh, for, for that to happen. Uh, so we maybe would go back to a premium which is higher than it stands today. Uh, the premium today is uh, maybe overdone. 20% uh, premium for a 60% uh, premium on uh, ROAs is not something which is justified. Maybe we are uh, go, we'll go back to FI22 sort of premiums. Uh, which is uh, on this slide about 50 to 60 percent and not the 110 percent as it existed before COVID. Uh, but uh, we need to remember that we launched this portfolio in FI 2021 when the premium was similar to FI 21, 22 numbers and not 20 percent. Uh, we did not enter at 100 percent premium. Uh, so even if you were to go back to those levels, uh, which is where some of the stocks uh, have started moving back to. Uh, whether it be an ICICI Lombard, whether it be a Chola, whether it be an Axis Bank, as soon as that starts happening, we see that uh, these stocks move back to levels of 18 to 20% long-term compounding. Suddenly, they start appearing to be good investments, just as uh, valuations start appearing to be normal or go back to their historical ranges. Um, and it's in these webinars that we've answered questions on Axis Bank and ICSA Lombard and HDFC Life from long periods of stagnation. But as soon as the valuations start going back to even their historical median or mean numbers, they appear to start looking good. Uh, so as soon as that happens for a HDFC or a Kotak or a Bajaj, uh, the portfolio compounding should start looking significantly better. Right. So the question on why are we so focused on ROAs um, when when what the equity shareholder gets is ROE, um, what's wrong with a PSU bank delivering a similar ROE with higher leverage compared to the, the banks in our portfolio? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question uh, because that is something that we also mull over um, quite extensively. Uh, one is the ROA tells you a lot about the character of the business. Uh, and the ROE tells you a lot about the character of the management. Uh, so the capital structure tells you a lot about uh, what the management wants to do. So for example, Kota uh, has always run a low leverage bank. Uh, it tells you that the management is focused, extremely focused on risk. The management is extremely focused on the long term and the sustainability of uh, the balance sheet over the long term. While the ROA tells you what really can the business do. ROA is an equivalent of ROIC, return on invested capital for a non-lending, non-financial company. It tells you how well can the business do. Uh, so for example, when we talk about ROA of two or two and a half percent, it tells us that even without leverage, uh, a good bank with a two, two and a half percent ROA uh, has a lot of room to take in credit costs, has a lot of room to suffer macro shocks, has a lot of room to take in unexpected events on its balance sheet. On the other hand, if you were to compare that to a company which is delivering 1% ROA and on the back of that with 18 to 20 times leverage, delivering 18% ROE, that's quite a fragile model uh, because uh, we don't know when the 1% ROA will be hit with only 20 bips of credit cost and will suddenly become a 13% return on equity in a single year. Uh, so when we are doing long-term investing, uh, we need to factor in 20% uh, 20 bips uh, movement of credit cost in a business which is prone to various macro shocks. In an extremely cyclical business, uh, it is better to be cautious, it is better to err on the side of caution uh, and therefore bake in uh, a lot of variation in various parts of the p and NIMS can be 20 bips lower, cost to income as we have seen can be 20 bips higher or lower, credit costs from various segments when these banks are lending to agri, SME, consumer unsecured, housing finance and corporate, uh, any of these segments can go through a rough patch and we can see 20 bips higher credit costs. And that will suddenly mean at 18 to 20 times leverage, a 20 bips lower or higher credit cost can mean a 5% change in return on equity. Uh, on the other hand, when you're leveraged five to six times or eight times, a 20 bips change in any of these metrics on ROA will only mean 1% change in return on equity. So that's the difference between a 20 times leveraged bank versus a eight to nine times leveraged bank. bank that the difference in return on equity will be 5% in one case versus 1% to 1.5% in the other case. Uh, so it's a question of how long our, is our time horizon of uh, investing. And therefore, uh, Kotak is a great example. When someone's running a bank or an institution with an extremely long time horizon, they'll make the right choice of capital structure of low leverage IROA. On the other hand, uh, some of these banks would be running at 18 to 20 times leverage because the time horizon of the shareholder might be quite different. Fair enough. Uh, is a related question on capital structure where a uh, client is asking um, the two related questions actually. One is uh, if the liquidity is such a challenge, why bother making a dividend payout? Uh, why not retain the dividends and boost liquidity there? Um, there's another question from the same gentleman on the opposite direction, which is if we believe that HDFC Bank or Kotak Bank uh, is extremely undervalued, um, why not start a buyback or, you know, for the bank to start a buyback and, and, and make use of uh, that undervaluation? Presumably, that sort of a buyback will generate a higher than 18% ROE, which they're currently generating on the book. Yeah. Uh, so for answering the first question on dividends, uh, it's more of a phenomena where uh, these companies have a large number of re retail investors who've been used to dividends. And it's seen that uh, as a company which regularly gives out, it pays out increasing dividends is a sign of a stable company, is a sign of a company which is doing well. So that's part one of the argument of why some of these banks pay dividends. 
Kotak Bank only has a has a dividend payout ratio of only two percent. So Kotak Bank's not a dividend paying company. Axis ICICI for a long time were not in a position to pay dividends. It's only in the last one one and a half years that ICICI Axis have started paying dividends. For the longest period of time, HDFC Bank has a dividend payout policy of twenty percent. So it's paying out twenty percent as dividend payout for a long long period of time. Uh, and the more uh, prosaic or the more mathematical answer around this is if these banks which are trading at more than one time book whether it's two two times book or four times book if they pay it out in the form of dividends so when hdfc bank has done 20% dividend payout for the last 20 years while it's a capital consuming entity it's raised equity at four times book which has been book value accretive so they're paying out dividends uh, over a period of time then they need capital for the business and then they raise capital at three to four times book it becomes book value accretive um, so it actually works out for the benefit of all shareholders uh, whether you are retail investment see dividends as a sign of a good thing or whether you are a long term investor who are there for the long term book value compounding of the business it works out for uh, the good for all types of investors because it is book value accretive when you raise equity rather than using the same equity and not distributing dividends for the business. Uh, so that's on uh, uh, the dividend part. Uh, the second question on buybacks. Uh, so like I said, Kotak uh, does not do any sort of uh, capital distribution, whether it's in the form of buybacks or uh, dividends. There is no form of capital distribution. In the case of HDFC Bank, uh, I think, uh, again, it's uh, more to ask from an investor perspective. Secondly, 20% uh, is all that they do. It's not uh, something that uh, is a large uh, number. Uh, and thirdly, I think uh, banks have also got rules in place on buybacks. They cannot do it beyond a certain percentage of net worth. They can also not do it uh, beyond... Uh, uh, they cannot take it beyond a certain promoter shareholding. So if Kotak Bank does a buyback, uh, Uday Kotak, who is the promoter, is, had to work hard to bring his stake down to below 26%, that stake will go up if they do a buyback. As soon as they do a buyback and the promoter does not participate. Fair enough. Um, so there's a question on systemic interest rates. Um, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll share my thoughts on our expectations. Um, whether it's in the West where the U.S. is reporting fairly healthy economic growth and jobs growth uh, month after month, and at the same time reporting uh, inflation which is stable or actually inched up based on yesterday's data, um, it, it doesn't seem that there is an interest cut on the annual. Similarly, in India, as we have seen, you know, last quarter GDP growth was reported as a healthy 8.5%. Uh, therefore, you could argue what is the what is the desperate need for an interest rate cut. That's our base case assumption. But uh, Tej, in terms of uh, implications on the portfolio, uh, should there be a rate cut? How do you how do you anticipate changes in the underlying fundamentals of the KCP companies? Yeah, there are a lot of uh, nuances and stock specific things which come in when interest rates move around for banks and NBFCs. Um, so if you were to first talk about banks, what happens is the exact opposite of what we've recently gone through. Uh, what we went through during 2022 uh, was in a rate cut environment, uh, first of all, and then in a, a rising rate environment uh, was that, first of all, immediately in a rising rate environment, the, the loans get reset. So as, as soon as we see a rate hike, as soon as we see a repo rate increase, all the loans on the banking side, on the asset side of the banks, they get reset upwards. Deposits take time to get reset. As a result of that, between Q1 to Q3, Q3 of FY23, we saw spreads of the banking sector go up. Uh, then over the next two to three quarters, we see these banks also start repricing of deposits. And as cost of funds start going up, we see that the spreads again start moderating and we again go back to the original spreads. If we see a rate cut, the banks will see on day one of a rate cut, a fall in their yields on advances without any fall in 
deposits and therefore we'll see an overnight reduction in spreads um uh, again we'll see two three four quarters of increasing casa ratios because people will start moving back money to current accounts people will stop moving back money to fixed deposits casa ratios will start increasing uh, we'll also see an increase in treasury income because treasury will see a mark to market gain um, and therefore uh, we'll see some amount of uh, neutralization of the impact of spreads uh, so the initial two or three quarters the banks will see a reduction in nims which will be offset by an increase in treasury income um, however from a perception perspective what happens is as soon as we see rate cuts financial services stocks start doing well because markets start perceiving that uh, we are in for a higher liquidity environment with a lower risk of asset quality issues you know falling rate interest rate environment plus stocks which are very close to uh, cost of equity in terms of return on equity benefit the most in a falling rate environment because banks usually generate return on equity of about 16 to 18% which is quite close to return on equity these are the companies which benefit the most when rates start falling unlike say a nestle which is generating 100% return on equity it's got nothing much to do with interest rates uh on the nbfc's front these will actually if rates start falling be the biggest beneficiaries of a falling interest rate environment first they have a large fixed rate book on the asset side uh say bajaj finance has uh, all its consumer durable loans which is about 15% of loans which is completely fixed at 25% irr or thereabouts uh all its unsecured loans b2c loans b2b loans all of that are also at a fixed rate uh and its lending is mclr linked lending uh, which is as soon as repo rates uh, start falling mclr also with a lag will start falling its therefore loan book uh, will be fixed but its liabilities uh, and cost of funds will start falling uh, along with that uh, nbfc's again from a perception perspective benefit the most when rates start falling uh, so chola bajaj large fixed rate books uh, will benefit and we've seen that historically over here in on this slide as well cost of funds for these companies started increasing uh, we again seen some moderation on cost of fund uh, on spreads because cost of funds have started rising uh, so net net uh, we should see uh, 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 a benefit for ben, uh, for nbfcs and uh, with uh, banks we should see a net net benefit over a 2 3 quarter period but uh, nbfcs will see benefits early on as soon as rate cuts start coming in the other plays in the portfolio infoage will be a big beneficiary of uh, rate cuts because it's a play on it services plus it's also got startup investments uh, insurance companies will also be a benefit be beneficiary because their investment book will start see mark to market gains fair enough um on the flip side we are seeing signs of the economy weakening uh, we are seeing slow down in job creation um given that a lot of the credit growth over the last 2 3 years has been around retail lending particularly unsecured lending um how is the kcp portfolio positioned should there be should there be a, a further weakening of the economy further weakening of job creation which in turn could result in npas from that retail unsecured lending book yeah i think uh, uh, that's something which is uh, likely to happen given where we are um, and uh, the purpose of doing this and assessing and testing our existing investments in financial services uh, is something that we are doing as we speak uh, given that we've been through three consecutive years of falling npas given we are in a place where there is absolutely no credit risk in the ecosystem plus there is dearth of liquidity um, and uh, uh, there is high amount of retail participation in the stock market lots of kips and ipos happening uh, in general it's been a very low risk environment this is an environment where uh, historically we have seen most of the mistakes happen and then they get unraveled about 6 to 6 months to 9 months later uh, so Uh, we believe that uh, the banking sector will see headwinds uh, across 
uh, margins. Uh, it will see headwinds, especially on credit costs um, and headwinds on growth over the next uh, one or two years. Uh, in that context, uh, uh, what we've discussed is when we analyze our portfolio, uh, we believe that barring two or three companies, we should be fine because we've generally held high quality companies which have actually not uh, done well in a high beta rally over the last two, three years, they will actually benefit from such an environment. Um, so whether it be the large banks, barring maybe we believe Axis Bank will not be a beneficiary of such an environment, the other three banks will be a beneficiary of that. Uh, City Union Bank will actually be shielded or has been shielded from a macro uh, downturn. Its uh, issues have been uh, a creation of its own in one way, uh, which has been issues on the regulatory front, issues on uh, uh, succession front. Uh, and the, on a smaller balance sheet, catering to MSMEs and SMEs in one state, uh, City Union Bank, which is not doing unsecured lending, should actually not be affected from what happens over the next couple of years. Um, it's actually seeing uh, sequential growth of 4%, which used to be 1% or 2% over the period last many quarters. Uh, so apart from Axis Bank or the banks, I think we are in a good place uh, in case there is a big downturn. Similarly, on the NBFCs, maybe apart from mass financial, I think uh, Chola, Bajaj, Avas have extremely strong, robust balance sheets. Uh, they should also do well. Uh, insurance companies, by definition, are defensive in nature and therefore should not be impacted by a macro downturn. Uh, so uh, from a, a downturn perspective, I think the posi uh, portfolio positioning has always been a bit defensive. Right. Um, so here's an interesting question on the liquidity aspect. Um, is there a structural component to low cost deposits of the banking sector getting compromised given that um, the emergence of say money market funds, which are sort of available at the uh, tips of your finger for a retail investor to move money from savings account, or for that matter, corporates getting savvier in terms of not leaving uh, too much money in current accounts. So CASA as a source of low cost deposit, is that getting structurally compromised for the banking system? And if yes, how should we think about sustainability of spreads and margins and hence our ways? Uh, yeah, so if we were to look at, therefore, the historical context, uh, even historically, uh, pre-demonetization, 35% was the average CASA ratio for the banking sector. It's never been 45% to 50%, some of what we saw during COVID. Because during COVID and during those two years, we saw a flood of money come in um, and banks also had no way to deploy that money. Um, the, um, retail investors also were not extremely active in capital markets. A lot of money was lying in low-cost deposits. Plus, interest rates were so low that the difference between an FD and a savings account was hardly anything or was not meaningful enough for people to move money to FDs. Uh, over the past year, as rates have gone up, as some of the smaller banks have started offering FDs of 8.5% to 9%, a lot of money has moved to FDs, a lot of money has moved to high-yielding instruments. And what that has resulted in is a fall in the CASA ratio for the banking system. But even this number today is still uh, around the long-term average uh, of the banking system. Uh, to put this into context, even after 150 years of the US banking system, JP Morgan has a CASA ratio of 26%, uh, which is zero cost money uh, at 26%. There are a large amount of savings account deposits in the US banking system, which are at 0%. Uh, which, so therefore, it's not only even CA, it's even SA, which is at 0%. Uh, similarly, Wells Fargo at 25%, Bank of America at 26-27%. Uh, and all of that in the U.S. is growing at, on a five-year Kager basis, at 7 to 8%. So J.P. Morgan, on its other large balance sheet, is growing that at 7 to 8%. Uh, in an economy which you would expect is, uh, should not have any arbitrage. It is much more developed. Uh, people should put money in money market funds uh, and still has so much money lying in zero-cost flow. Uh, so over here as well, I think we have a long way to go. Plus, as we have seen on this chart, the absolute amount of deposits being garnered 
Now, or the challenge on liquidity is looking like that because uh, uh, loans are growing at 16% after a long period of time for the sector. It's not because deposits are growing at a slow pace. Deposits, the blue line on this chart, is actually growing at one of its highest growth rates in a long period of time. It's growing at 14% or 15%, which it will not grow at for a long period of time. It's because loans are growing at 16%, some of the banks will have to take a call on slowing down loan growth. And eventually, the big question then comes is, okay, if deposits don't grow, or if low-cost CASA does not come into the system, what that results in is cost of funds for the banking system goes up. The big question, therefore, is can banks pass that on to the eventual borrowers? Uh, if the cost of capital goes up, is do the banks have enough bargaining power to pass that on to the borrowers? Uh, because we are in an economy where the bond market does not exist, the largest lender continues to be the banking system. It's eventually come down to six banks or seven banks which have 70% of market share, uh, which is the big four banks on the private side. Uh, if you add Bank of Baroda, PNB, SBI, that's about 60, 65%. And then if you add some of the larger NBFCs, you get to 70% of the total market share with seven or eight lenders. And actually, it's these seven or eight lenders which have almost 100% incremental market share. So the only lenders in the economy uh, are the seven or eight lenders, no sort of insurance companies lending, no bond market really exists. Therefore, we believe that there is a lot of room for these lenders to pass on the increase in cost of funds in case we are in for a structural increase for the liability side of these banks getting repriced for a lower CASA ratio. Fair enough. Um, so let's move to another aspect of our investment framework, which is succession planning. Um, a number of companies in our portfolio have been through it, starting with HTFC Bank five years ago. We've seen the impact of that. We don't know if the uh, if the if the derating is related to that, now we've seen uh, with Kotak, uh, saw with ICICI and Lombard, uh, we saw what happened with Avas. Um, I guess City Union Bank is likely to go through that. Uh, however, here the valuation may not be an issue. Um, how are we? Uh, what's our emerging thinking around uh, valuations or ratings? of the stock compared to uh, changes in management? Yeah, I think uh, very difficult to attribute uh, derating and stock prices to uh, succession, uh, even in hindsight, uh, leave aside to predict it. Uh, because uh, if you were to look at HDFC and Kotak Bank, uh, they have gone through a derating, uh, you could say because of succession, you could also say then why did Bajaj Finance see a even higher D rating than HDFC and Kotak uh, without any succession event? Uh, so actually, if you were to look at data, Bajaj Finance has seen a D rating which is higher than HDFC and Kotak over the last two and a half years because EPS growth has been 30%. For now two and a half years, uh, stock price return has been around 5%. On the other hand, HDFC and Kotak have seen 18% stock price 18% profit growth during the same period of time and 0% stock price return. So Bajaj Finance with no succession event has seen a higher D rating than these two stocks. Similarly, ICICI Lombard has delivered 60% returns after the succession took place uh, and uh, zero returns till the succession event took place uh, when profits were growing at 15%. Uh, so it's difficult to say, and in my opinion, it's got very little to do with only succession. It's got more to do with industry structure, and it's got more to do with what's happening in the rest of the industry, where we've seen SBI, I say, I say, access, catch up on fundamentals. We've seen the sector open up. We've seen uh, the perception of some of these banks change. Uh, and if we were to take, I say, I say, Lombard, which is a very good example, uh, of what's happened in the as an equivalent in the banking system. In ICS Lombard's case, between 21 and 23, the general insurance industry was going through multiple headwinds. 
what happened over the last year is motor insurance saw some amount of discipline come in. Uh, none of the issues of health claims due to COVID uh, were there. Motor sales growth came back. As a result of that, the insurance industry saw its combined ratio fall from 115% or 120% to 112%. Because there is no real listed general insurance company apart from ICICI Lombard, the market saw that this change is happening. ICICI Lombard will be a big beneficiary. ICICI Lombard got pre-rated, we saw 50-60% returns for ICIC Lombard. Uh, I'm quite certain that if there would have been a low-quality PSU insurer or some other low-quality general insurance company, that would have seen a 150% sort of price increase. Uh, and maybe ICIC Lombard would not have seen any increase in its share price because the market would have veered toward, towards some of the low-quality insurance companies. In the case of banking, it's quite the opposite which has happened because there have been a host of listed banks which have been available, which have benefited from 2020 to 2020-2022 fall in NPS for the banking sector. A lot of money have, has flown to most of these low-quality names which have seen the highest amount of benefit from the fall in NPS uh, of the banking system. And HDFC, Kodak, Bajaj have not benefited as much as some of the other names. And therefore, more than uh, succession in isolation, succession uh, also has a role to play, but more than success, succession in isolation, it's more to do with a con factors to do with high P multiples or high valuations to start off with, along with the management transition happening with that, along with the rest of the sector seeing a relatively better uh, positive change than these companies themselves. When all of these things happen, uh, the share prices go through not even a correction, but a time correction. Um, in that, I think it's been a learning that if all of these three are happening together, then we need to be cognizant of that and maybe stay away, stay out, uh, depending on what's happening, but not make a blanket sort of yes or no answer because each and every situation has been different. Because if you would have done that, in ICICI Lombard, uh, the outcome could have been very different from HDFC or Kotak. Fair enough. So you've in some ways preempted my next question because there are lots of people asking questions around. Has Marcellus changed its valuation approach um, to the extent that you're saying that um, if the starting P multiples were high, naturally a succession planning issue or an industry structure change like you saw in the case of general insurance, or for that matter, a few other people are asking, is Bajaj derating a result of the threat coming from geofinance or could be any of the fintech lenders and so on. Uh, could you explain to our clients what is our current thinking in terms of valuation? How do we think about uh, stocks while buying them at the entry price? Yeah, I think uh, we've become more, far more aware, that's for sure, on valuations and uh, we've been far more aware on we do on the fact that we do not need to pay up uh, extremes on valuations, especially. Uh, and to put it very simply, we want to stay away from extremes when it comes to valuations, whether the company is going through a great period of time or not. Uh, and especially when we are paying up for peak margins or peak ROAs, peak ROEs, along with peak P multiples. Uh, we try to be extremely cognizant of that. Fortunately, as it stands today, uh, we are far away from that, especially in this portfolio. Uh, as we have discussed, this is where we stand. Um, there are reds across the board. Uh, whether we look at three, uh, whether we look at any sort of triangulation, which is versus the rest of the sector, versus the own history of these companies, uh, versus a three or five year average on valuations or versus the bank nifty or nifty. Uh, most of these companies are not um, flashing, uh, you know, exorbitant numbers on price to book multiples or PE multiples uh, for us to say that we need to get out. Uh, wherever that was the case, Home First Finance is a company which we used to own, no longer in the portfolio. As soon as it touched valuations which were similar to that of a Bajaj Finance or a Chola, uh, for significantly lower returns on equity, we play, press the exit button and we were out of home first finance. Uh, so that is uh, uh, 
our valuation approach in real action. Uh, similarly, even companies which have entered the portfolio, uh, when we entered City Union Bank, uh, we believe it's a lower quality franchise than almost everything else that we own in the portfolio. Uh, but we have therefore entered City Union Bank at about 1.2 times price to book. Uh, similarly, when we entered Prudent Corporate uh, or uh, new entry, which we are uh, currently making in the portfolio, which is uh, a capital market play, uh, none of these companies are paying top dollar on valuations, uh, even though these are companies which all clear uh, Marcellus's filters on governance and quality and um, high growth and return on equity. Uh, so we are not leaving aside our focus on quality. With that same focus on quality, we are only entering into companies which are uh, reasonably valued and which justify its current P multiples. Also, on the same note, we are exiting companies uh, on an ongoing basis where we believe that uh, they are overvalued or there is no significant room for valuation or P multiples expanding. Great. So in fact, you preempted one question, which was an aberration uh, in terms of the fit into our portfolio, City Union Bank, where uh, the client is asking, it seems like you moved from quality at any price to um, anything which is uh, which is value. Um, you might want to clarify why City Union Bank is anything but not quality, uh, uh, notwithstanding the last three years. So City Union Bank actually used to be uh, used to be super quality between 2012 to 20, and it used to post great numbers. Uh, along with HDFC Kotak, it was actually the only bank which used to produce 15% plus return on equity during that period of time. Uh, along with extremely consistent growth, uh, CASA ratio, cost of funds, asset quality, all of that was top notch and comparable to a HDFC or a Kotak. Uh, after 2020, during 21 and 23, it uh, uh, faced its own set of challenges. City Union Bank, first of all, saw a lot of uh, regulatory challenges. In an RBI inspection, it was uh, told to do a host of things. It was told to improve its processes. Uh, there were no misgivings on governance during that RBI inspection. Therefore, uh, we stay clear on companies where we fear that numbers are not right or numbers are cooked up, but there are no misgivings on governance or there were no findings which said that uh, there are significant deviations on what the NPAs were reported versus what the real NPAs are. But uh, uh, what the RBI did uh, and the bank has now implemented is all for the positive. And what that resulted in was a 12-month period when uh, banking sector loan growth was 15%, City Union Bank loan growth was 0%. That led to a significant derating in the stock. The reason that we have entered into the stock is everything else uh, that we liked about City Union Bank remains. Its conservative cost of funds remain one of the lowest in the banking sector. Uh, in its own region of Tamil Nadu, it's a well-recognized name. Uh, what's deteriorated a bit is it's fallen behind some of these large private sector banks which have entered the territory of Tamil Nadu and taken away market share. However, uh, we don't uh, see how City Union Bank can't grow at 15% now, given that it's been through this period of 0% growth. We've bought into City Union Bank, we believe, at an inflection point of when it goes from 0% to 14-15% again. Uh, and we are starting to see early signs of that. Uh, uh, re it's recently reported that it's delivered 4% sequential growth in the March quarter. 4% translate in, translates into 15% analyzed growth. So if we see that inflection point and we have bought a stock at 1.2 price to book, we should not see any downside. Whatever upside we get, we'll take with both hands and uh, hopefully we are able to get some re-rating on top of that. Great. Um, just last question, a uh, couple of them are asking, um, how should we think about uh, recovery. Of course, the past performance has been suboptimal, but should we continue to hold on? How should we think about the recovery both in absolute returns and relative returns? Yeah, I think uh, we should look at this just as any stock, uh, just like buying any stock. Uh, KCP is, uh, we can go into details and nuances, but just like a stock, broadly it's available at 22 times trailing PE multiple, lower than Nifty valuations. 
for better than Nifty ROE and better than Nifty PAT compounding. So 20% plus PAT compounding, 16, 17% return on equity, 22% trailing P multiple, and uh, we'd like to believe more sustainable PAT compounding in ROE than the Nifty because uh, the Nifty goes through 4, 5% PAT compounding, 8% ROE all the way to 14, 15% ROE and 18% PAT compounding. But on a blended basis, while the last two, three years, Nifty has seen 18, 20% PAT compounding on the back of commodities, on the back of PSU banks doing well. On a blended basis, cross cycle, Nifty does 12, 13% ROE, 12, 13% PAT compounding. This portfolio should do 18 to 20% PAT compounding, 16, 17% ROE for valuations which are, as we speak, lower than Nifty valuations. So on a relative basis on outperformance, this portfolio should do better. In on an absolute basis, we should look at broadly whatever the pad compounding is. From here on, it should do 80 to 20 percent compounding. Fantastic. There you go, folks. Uh, you're looking at a portfolio with superior quality to that of the benchmark, uh, available at significant discount to that of the benchmark, um, which is what investing is all about. We're getting this opportunity there. We would recommend staying invested. Um, if you have further questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We would be happy to address them. Thank you. Thanks, Tej, for this insightful presentation. And thanks to all our clients for having dialed in um, and, and, and listening to us. Until next time.